Our lives are defined by the way we see the world. So let's reimagine, reimagine, and reimagine again. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for coming, and thanks to this amazing team. Change of pace. <laughs> uh, many of you know that designer babies are no longer science fiction. This man is Ha Jiangkui. Until recently, Dr. Ha was a biology professor in Shenzhen, China, and the founder of several biotech companies. A little more than a year ago, in November 2018, he made a startling announcement at a high-profile conference that took place in Hong Kong. He told the hundreds of scientists and journalists gathered there that he had used a powerful new gene-editing tool called CRISPR to create the world's first genetically modified babies, twin girls, who he named Lulu and Nana. Now, the term designer baby, or CRISPR baby, refers to a child who would develop from an embryo or a sperm or an egg that had been genetically altered. The changes that were made would affect every cell in that child's body and would be passed down to its children and their children. And the process of this is often called heritable genome editing. This was all hypothetical until the birth of Lulu and Nana. But the prospect of being able to control the genes and the traits of future generations, that's been debated for decades. Between the 1990s and now, something like 50 countries have actually passed laws saying this should be off limits, against the law. And in Europe, 29 nations have signed on to a binding treaty that prohibits it. There are a few key countries, including our own, including China and Russia, that don't have clear-cut laws, but they do have regulations and guidelines that should rule it out. But despite all this, when Ha Jiangkui uh, revealed his designer baby experiment, he thought he would be hailed as a hero. He'd made YouTube videos boasting about what he'd done. He'd set up email accounts so that the fan mail that he expected to the babies to get could be handled and he thought he'd be in line for a Nobel Prize, but instead he was widely and harshly condemned. Observers around the world pointed to numerous appalling violations of very basic medical ethics. For example, he gave a consent form to the baby's parents that described his reckless experiment as something like a vaccine. Scientists quickly identified serious problems with the technical results that he presented. And the bottom line there is that the changes that in the embryos that became Lulu and Nana were not the changes that were intended. So those girls have genomes unlike any that ever existed before. And no one knows what that will mean for their future health. Dr. Ho was quickly fired from his university job and his research was suspended. And recently, just a few weeks ago, a Chinese court sentenced him and two of his associates to prison time. But back at the gene editing conference where He Jiangkui made his big reveal, a funny thing happened. The conference organizers joined in on the denunciations, but then they made a pivot. They moved from condemning Dr. He to celebrating the idea of moving forward with heritable genome editing. They said, quote, it is time to define a rigorous, responsible translational pathway toward clinical trials. In other words, what they were telling the world was, this guy, Ha Jiangkui, he's a bad apple, but we're the responsible scientists, and we can give designer babies a green light. And that is pretty much where the debate still sits. So, on one side, you have those who agree with the countries that have banned heritable genome editing. In that view, it would be wonderful if scientists can continue to develop gene editing 
into therapies that can help people who are sick. Hopefully those therapies will be safe, effective, and affordable. But gene editing for human reproduction to control the traits of future children, that should remain off limits, at least for now and perhaps for always. Many prominent scientists hold this view, along with many physicians, many biotech industry figures, bioethicists, scholars, and many public interest and social justice advocates like my own organization, the Center for Genetics and Society. But there are scientists and others who want to move forward. And they include influential Americans in among the organizers of that Hong Kong meeting who are now actually at work mapping out how heritable genome editing should move forward, skipping right over the question of whether it should happen at all. And the controversy rages on. And although all sides say that this is a question that needs broad and inclusive public participation, the debate is still dominated by scientists. And that's a real problem, because the way this question is resolved will affect all of us, all of our children. It will shape the future. And there's another problem, too, and that is that many of the discussions and media accounts of heritable genome editing that you'll encounter have some serious gaps and distortions that make it really hard to figure out what's going on and what's at stake. So what I want to do now is just very briefly mention three points that I'd recommend you look out for as you're reading more about this issue. Three questions to keep in mind as you reach your own assessment about whether the future we want to build together has a place in it for CRISPR babies. So first, when you're reading an article or listening to a conversation or discussion about human gene editing, is it clear whether the topic under consideration is, on the one hand, treating patients versus, on the other, altering embryos to create genetically modified babies? When this discussion is muddy, as it often is, it can sound as if opposing CRISPR babies means giving up on hope for gene therapies. And of course, that is not the case. The second point that needs to be clear is this. If the goal is to avoid passing on serious inherited diseases, there's no need to mess around with the genes of future children. 100% of parents who carry that risk can avoid it. First off, by using donated sperm or eggs. And if it's important to those prospective parents that their child be genetically related to both, they can do that too. In very nearly every case, with a well-established embryo screening technique. Now, screening and selecting embryos isn't ethics-free. It raises thorny questions about what kinds of people we'll welcome into our world. But it's far safer, and it's far less ethically fraught than manipulating the genes of future children. So when you hear that gene editing is needed to save babies from terrible inherited diseases, and you will hear that, know that this is more than a bit misleading. The third key point to watch out for is whether physical risks are the only ones that are mentioned. Now, of course, health and safety are very, very important. And it's also true that the risk that gene editing would introduce to a future child, that's the, the risk that they would introduce harms rather than uh, reduce harms is substantial. But we also need to carefully consider the dangerous societal consequences if heritable genome editing were to take hold. And the truth is, if it's permitted at all, it's very likely to spread. Efforts to allow CRISPR babies only in limited circumstances, however well-intentioned, can't be expected to hold either in policy or in practice. And it's not hard to imagine what would happen next. Fertility clinics would begin to market genetic upgrades <coughs> to parents affluent enough to afford them. For the fertility industry, this would be a whole new customer base. And for parents, a whole new area of peer pressure. The ad copy writes itself. Don't you want the best for your child to be? But remember, this really is a once in a lifetime opportunity. You must act before you get pregnant. And then what? 
Well, let's take a look at how designer babies have been imagined in our culture. I'm going to show you a few recent magazine covers as an illustration of this. We have this one from Time. MIT Technology Review, we can now engineer the human race. This is that image of a designer baby I showed you before. It was on the cover of The Economist. Here's Cosmos. And here's Time again. One thing I hope you've noticed is that all these babies have something in common, and that is fair skin, blonde hair, blue eyes. Now, to be sure, the genetic components, even of hair, eye, and skin color, are complex. And that's far more true when you get to traits like athleticism or intelligence. So no one thinks that you can get a high IQ baby or a Stephen Curry baby just by tweaking a few genes. But that has not stopped some scientists who are on the techno-enthusiastic side from publicizing lists of genes that they foresee being targeted. And it may not stop those ads from being persuasive, because just the perception that gene-edited kids would be superior could jumpstart a market. And these kinds of perceptions do matter. We know from the sordid histories of racism and eugenics that ugly social disparities and discrimination can be powerfully fueled by false beliefs that some of us are fitter or better than others. So my view, as I think you've gathered, is that there's no good reason to develop heritable genome editing, and there's no good reason to run its risks. Unless we want to build a future that's divided into genetic haves, haves and genetic have-nots, let's agree to keep that door shut. Thank you.